Um, live from the Orion Cygnus arm of the Milky Way galaxy, this is Scientifically Speaking, a weekly half-hour program devoted to elegant curiosities. And I am one of your hosts, Sarah Chang, and joining me, as always, is Bernie Ryan, DJ Star Watcher. How are you doing, Bernie? Yes, hi, Sarah. Very good. Thank you. Bernie is our professor of the Astronomy Lab at USM and our protector of the night skies here in Maine. Um, Bernie also writes for the, for Skylights, the official newsletter of the Astronomical Society of Northern New England. Reach out to us at WMPG Scientifically Speaking at gmail.com or on Twitter at WMPG Speak. Bernie, yes. what's up in the night sky for this coming week? Good. I'm glad you asked. We have an excellent week coming up. Mars will be at its best in 26 months. And not only will it be at opposition coming up next week, so later on this week, it'll actually be the best one for the next 15 years till 2035. Ooh. So basically this Friday being October 2nd, you'll have a full moon. It was technically full on Thursday night, but it will look full still. And Mars will be very close to the moon. There's almost like a kickoff to get the thing going. The moons will point out Mars and be aware that it's going to be at opposition on the 13th, but actually closest to the Earth on October 6th. It's only going to be 39 million miles away. I mean, that's just a number, but usually even at opposition, it's over 40 million, and it gets as far as 100 million miles away. So it's very close, and that means you can see a lot of features in the telescope. I looked at it the other, other um, last week. We saw some of the dark markings, some of the ice caps. Sometimes you can see some of the atmosphere. In a big enough telescope, you can see Olympus Mons, the big... Uh, wow, you know, that's you can a see lot this. of detail. Yeah, you can see some of And you can only see this for about a month or two every two years, roughly. And this would be the month to see all that. So obviously, if you don't have your own telescope, try to get a hold of someone with one, or at least, you know, be aware or look on some online things. We can get some images of Mars. And the other thing, Jupiter and Saturn, they're getting closer and closer together because they both finished the retrograde, so now they're moving in the regular eastward direction, and Jupiter is actually catching up with Saturn. It's going to be a quarter degree apart on the winter solstice, December 21st. It's wow. getting closer and closer over the whole next season, so be aware of that. See how that happens. And then if you get up around 4, Venus comes up about 4 in the morning. But the real feature will be Mars, and also be aware that we have launched three different countries, have launched missions to Mars successfully. They're on the way. They should be there by spring of next year. It takes about eight months to get there. So the, the U.S. Uh, launched the Perseverance rover, which is going to have a drone that's going to fly through the Martian atmosphere to photograph everything. That'll be pretty neat. And then the Chinese have launched one. And it actually, the, the Chinese in Chinese means questions for heaven. So it's kind of a neat, the name of the Chinese mission. They have a, they have a rover, um, an orbiter, and a lander. It's the heaviest payload ever launched to Mars. Wow. And the United Arab Emirates launched one, which was mostly built in this country, but they launched one too. So six different vehicles will be on Mars by um, late next winter and early spring. So we're kind of invading Mars again. So be aware of that. Wow. Now we're, are we going to have traffic problems there? There could be this. We'll be <laughs> traffic police. <laughs> well, we'll be there physically by 2035. So, but... So we're sending more and more things to probably get ready for that actual sure. Mars in just about 15 years. Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And if Bernie talked way too fast, you can also check out the monthly What's Up column in the Portland Press Herald. Thanks for that, Bernie. Yeah, you're welcome. So today's show is a part two continuation of our show from last week. Um, we have a guest named David Rode, who is the author of In Deep the FBI, the CIA, and the truth about America's deep state, which was published earlier this year in April of 2020. He's also the executive editor of The New Yorker Online. Um, he's a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner, and he's kind of an amazing investigative journalist, and we're so excited to have him on. Political science is also a science, and so uh, that's kind of the focus of the show. Uh, check out last week's show if you want to hear part one. Enjoy. So specifically now in the book, I came across a few interesting things. Uh, you say, for instance, you probably raise it more like a question at the end of the prologue part. Um, if the CIA and the FBI, are they really abusing the public trust or more protecting the public trust? I wonder what kind of conclusion maybe you reached with that. 
So I, I found that the CIA and FBI in the past have, you know, have engaged in real abuses of the American public. Um, it was worse uh, during the Cold War. The book starts out talking about um, a big investigation by Congress by something called the Church Committee. Uh, it was part of the Senate that exposed decades of the FBI spying on Americans engaged in totally legal political activity. Uh, and the FBI, you know, they looked at the John Birch Society on the right and infiltrated them and tried to get information to discredit them. And then they also uh, infiltrated civil rights groups. They tried to discredit Martin Luther King. Um, but since then, there's, there's been all this oversight set up. There's a federal court that approves, you know, uh, wiretapping uh, requests uh, from the FBI. There are, you know, intelligence committees in the House and the Senate that have subpoena powers and are supposed to monitor the way all these uh, organizations function. There's been scandals. We can talk about more than Snowden leaks and, and other things. But what we see now uh, since the 70s is presidents using the CIA or the FBI to kind of do improper things. Uh, some folks argued that, you know, George W. Bush's use of the CIA was, was improper in terms of uh, some of the uh, interrogation and, and torture techniques that were used. Some people argue that Barack Obama was using the CIA for too many drone strikes when he was president. But the, we, we have, so the, the core finding is that there, in, there aren't rogue actors, there aren't CIA and FBI agents running around the country with no oversight whatsoever. Um, mm. And I, I don't like the term deep state. I, I basically found that there is no deep state in the way President Trump uses the term. There are these very powerful institutions. They need to be watched over very carefully by Congress and the courts and the president and the press. Uh, you know, I, but I had members of the Trump administration privately tell me there is no organized plot um, to force President Trump from office. That, that's an exaggeration. And the, the president often exaggerates. And this is uh, an example of one of them. Yeah. yeah Suzanne, that, um, you, you were talking about the CIA trying to discredit MLK. Could you kind of expand on that? Sure. What were they trying to do specifically? It was, um, it was actually, so it was interesting. The, the CIA, um, during uh, the anti-Vietnam War protests, they were um, targeting student um, organizations. Uh, they actually uh, put under surveillance uh, John Lennon, uh, the famous Beatles member who was you know, in the US uh, part, taking part in the protest, that was the CIA. They were convinced that there were foreign governments funding all the anti-Vietnam War protests. There, there weren't, it was you know, genuine protests. And then it was the FBI, Sarah, that was going after Martin Luther King. They wiretapped his room, uh, they, um, in one famous and, and terrible incident, they sent an audio tape, uh, a letter to Martin Luther King uh, and his wife. And uh, it was an anonymous letter. That it was written by an FBI agent, but, it, but it, they didn't identify where it was coming from. And the letter said that the audio tape proved that Martin Luther King was having extramarital affairs on his wife. Uh, and they, the, the, this, this anonymous letter uh, written surreptitiously by FBI agents urged Martin Luther King to kill himself um, before going and accepting the Nobel Peace Prize in Oslo, that he was going to be, this tape would be released and he would be, you know, ruined and shamed. Uh, luckily, Dr. King didn't, didn't believe that. But that was the kind of level of sort of dirty tricks that the FBI was engaged in. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover, mm -hmm. he was the head of the FBI for 50 years, nearly 50 years, um, did all this thinking that Martin Luther King and in general communists were infiltrating American society and 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 things got out of control uh, half a million Americans were investigated by the FBI or the CIA as I said earlier you know they were engaged in lawful constitutionally protected political activities that has largely decreased since these reforms were enacted in the 70s um, but these are powerful po and the la back to the web in the digital age it's more than ever Sorry, it's easier than ever for the government and private companies to spy on all of us. Much more of our personal lives is just out there online for them to hack and, you know, our photos, our emails, you know, and, and so, again, a great challenge of, of this era is how, you know, we don't have adequate legislation to protect our privacy on the web. We have to create better laws and, and sort of guidelines for the web. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful and amazing 
almost you know world that's emerged but it's a wild west right now yeah, yeah. Interesting. so but then the basic theory would be then if you're not doing anything wrong why does it matter if everyone can see what you're doing that's true but i i just you know and i i had a, a former official from the national security agency the big eavesdropping mm -hmm. organization they, they said that very soon, you know, private companies will have more, be collecting more information than national security agency is. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, they're profiting from it. You know, they, they, and this is, there's a thing where, you know, tech people, that journalists are jealous of tech people and they, they mm -hmm. ate our lunch in terms of a business model and, you know, newspapers didn't change and put on, create online classifieds. And that's true. We, we failed, I think, as businesses, but um, it's astonishing um, they just had the, um, that, the, the hearing before Congress. It was, you know, uh, the four largest tech companies, you know, are, are worth, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars. Mm. And it's, you know, that there isn't, they don't have responsibility for vetting information, for guarding people's privacy. It, it's, it's astonishing. Like they, they should have to devote resources, I think, for more, more vetting, given how much money they're making. And, and again, how they use our private data uh, to make, to make money. Yeah, they could do it for that. Of course, the other thing would be it could undermine democracy itself, even because they would know all this about us. So even though we have nothing wrong, then they could decide to kind of make us do something and that type of thing. So I think there's a funny alliance in the Senate between Ron Wyden, he's a liber you know, liberal Democrat from Oregon, and Rand Paul, who's a libertarian, you know, Republican from Kentucky. They're both very focused on privacy. So you know, whoever wins in November, I would think, you know, there is one issue that, you know, liberals and conservatives can agree on is that they would want that, you know, conservatives don't want the government spying on them. Liberals don't want big business spying on them. That, that, that's an area where there could be some kind of common ground about setting up rules and, and protecting our privacy. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because um, when you kind of talked about how conservatives define the deep state as kind of administrative encroaching on individual rights and then liberals defining it as like a military industrial complex. I couldn't figure out like where, for example, Snowden and, you know, all the NSA mass surveillance, like which one of those camps does that technically fall under? Because it, in a way, it sounds like it's the encroaching of our rights because they're keeping data. But at the same time, Trump is like, no, if you if you come back, we'll you know put you, throw you in jail, um, and so I, I couldn't like figure out like where where does that fall? Um, but now that you mentioned like oh, it seems like one of those points where we you know the two sides would agree on, um, even though we it, like we would agree on them from different kind of surveillance from different uh, or data collection from different uh, sources, I guess. Yeah, it's it. So the, and I'll do a little nerdy history here. Sorry. Do it. Uh, <laughs> we love that. <laughs> so yeah, actually, and I can, I'll bring it to Trump. So that I think <laughs> I mentioned that they, you know, all these, you know, these, these, these um, all this spying going on. Um, uh, um, the, the CIA was like opening all these people's mail. Richard Nixon's mail was opened by like U.S. government agents, you know, during the Cold War, John Steinbeck's mail. So now it's just, it's all electronic. So there was a court established after all the scandals were emerged in the 70s, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance uh, Act, FISA. So it's called the FISA court. And that's where the FBI goes in and asks for warrants from a judge to surveil people. 9-11 um, happens. George W. Bush, th there's a sense among some Republicans and Bill Barr, the attorney general today, that the president, that these reforms, you know, having congressional committees watching, you know, what the FBI and CIA are doing, having, you know, needing a judge for a eavesdropping thing is limiting the ability of the president, you know, and the FBI and the, 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 and the CIA that the president controls from like protecting the country. So after 9-11, George W. Bush started a massive surveillance program inside the United States and intentionally did not go to that newly established court, the FISA court, and ask for a warrant. He had an internal legal opinion that said, the president can do this. It doesn't have, the presidency doesn't have to ask the judicial branch for permission to do this. That, you know, became public. There was a lot of complaints. And then he eventually did go to that court and get permission. Barack Obama comes in promising to sort of 
you know, respect the, the, the congressional oversight, the, the court oversight. And the interesting thing about Snowden was that every um, type of surveillance that Snowden revealed had been approved by a judge. Uh, you know, the Obama administration may be too cautious, but was very lawyerly. And so they, they didn't have secret programs going on that, you know, Congress or the courts didn't know about. And but when Snowden made the extent of that surveillance public, it really sort of shocked Americans. And and they were, I talked to members of the Obama administration who were surprised at how outraged people were. They said, "Well, we went to a judge and we got a warrant." That FISA court, bringing it up to the present day, is where the FBI went and got surveillance warrants for Carter Page. Uh, Carter Page is the he was at that point a former campaign advisor. I can talk about this. I was one of the reporters running around. I, I, I had, I worked actually at Reuters news agency. It's a terrific news organization. We had copies of the dossier about Trump and I was running around and trying to find out if the dossier was true. And um, parts of the dossier said that this guy, Carter Page, uh, a Trump campaign advisor was meeting with top, uh, a guy named Igor Sechin, who's like a senior Russian official and close to Putin. And, um, that's what prompted the FBI to go out and carry out this surveillance. Um, and, and they got permission from a judge to do it. Um, but you know, that's become this big issue about, um, again, President Trump is right. Uh, uh, there was problems with the application to get, uh, relying on the dossier, that was some of the evidence to surveil uh, Page. Um, but again, the president sort of exaggerating you know, what happened. Um, the, the, the first several months of surveillance of Carter Page were sort of legally justified, but it, it went on beyond that. Uh, there was an FBI lawyer that didn't put, uh, didn't share um, evidence that would have helped Page. Um, so that anyway, the FISA court needs reform. It's a secret court. There's no outsiders who can watch the evidence. There's no defense lawyers. And that's got to change. That's one of these safeguards that was put in, in the 70s that, that didn't work. Uh, and and the Snowden scandal shows the same thing. So I think there needs to be much more um, transparency in that court and in how surveillance is done in the US. Yeah, I mean, they were, they were saying that about um, kind of some of the, uh, what Snowden had leaked was that, yeah, they might've gotten the, the, the right to do that, but then they kind of over, continued to overstep their bounds. And I was, I think, was it this month that they said that it was ruled illegal, like what they did? Yes, there was a, there was, a, they were collecting people's phone numbers. And I think that they, they went beyond uh, what, what was legally authorized. There's a separate problem in the intelligence community where they overclassify everything. They keep things secret. And I think they were, they were not informing Congress that everything they were doing. And, and that was found to be illegal, you know, overkill. And so, um, but again, um, so right now the, the Senate intelligence committee, which has subpoenas and a big staff, um, generally is working well. They came out with a big report about the interference in 2016 recently, and Republicans and Democrats largely agreed that, you know, the, the, the um, Russia intervened to aid Trump, but they also agreed that there was not proof that Trump, you know, worked, you know, in a conspiracy with the Russians, that he benefited from it, but he, but he wasn't part of a conspiracy. The House Intelligence Committee, and this is where our, our division and our partisanship hurts us, is barely functional. Um, the intelligence committee there is, you know, uh, just completely divided along partisan lines. So they are not effectively monitoring what the intelligence agencies are doing because they're so busy scoring points with each other. And this gets back to like this constant, you know, scorched earth politics hurts us. It hurts our ability to control these dangerous spy agencies. It hurts our ability to respond to the pandemic because we're in an endless political partisan war where we can't even agree on basic facts. Do you think that, um, I think earlier you had mentioned, you described Trump as being very persuasive. Um, do you think- He is an extremely, <laughs> I'm, 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 I wanna be, I'm, and it's really important, you know, anyway, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, again, I think he's made, I trust the Washington Post, he's made more than 15,000 false and misleading statements. He is a very disciplined and effective communicator. Yeah. It's sticking with the same message and, and using it over and over again. And sorry, meaning he uses deep state to discredit, 
you know, government officials who contradict him. You know, he uses the term witch hunt. He used witch hunt for Robert Mueller and that investigation and, and for a, a big chunk of the country that effectively discredited Robert Mueller. And then lastly, fake news. He's used it very effectively to have a very large part of the country, you know, not believe me and right. other mainstream journalists. So he's, he is very effective in that sense. Right. I guess like when, when you describe all of that, it almost, uh, I mean, there's like two words that kind of come to mind. The first one is paranoia, um, like almost like personal paranoia. Like, you know, you could be that one person and feel like everybody's out to get you. Um, like a group that I think about is like incels who often Terrible. like, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, even though what they believe is not necessarily true, but they believe it so much, they, they just start to do terrible things. Um, but the other part of it, it that that the other word that comes to mind is, um, I guess, the content that Trump kind of, as you say, is like really consistent about in his communication. Uh, it reminds me of like kind of show talk, talk, the the people that he's talking to he's kind of convincing them that they're victims of something and, yes. and politics uh, of grievance. Yeah. And I wonder if that's kind of what makes him so persuasive because everybody, when, I mean, this is in all, even, even in like liberal camps too, where like, if you are told that, or if you kind of believe like, Oh, I've been a victim of something, whether like even like modern times, gaslighting, you know, you almost become empowered and you feel like, yes, that's, you know, and you gain some sort of uh, strength, uh, even if it might not be true. Um, so I don't know, it, it, those two things kind of come to mind when you talk about that and, you know, how he just fires people who, um, who contradict him or anything like that. It's, it's like he's it, it, like paranoid about I don't know. I don't even know what it is. It feels like he's he, paranoid. Just two things. He, so f speaking with current and former aides to the president, Donald Trump doesn't sincerely, he does not believe that like nonpartisan public service exists. He mm. thinks that everyone is kind of putting spin on the ball, whether you're a scientist at the CDC or you're a reporter asking a question in the like you always have an room. agenda. You want to, you want to, you know, you want to boost your own career and make yourself look good. And he comes out of this hyper competitive world in New York real estate where that's what everybody's doing. So, you know, and, and that's his worldview. He doesn't, you know, and so he's, what, what is it? Exaggerated hyperbole. Or I can't remember the term he uses, but that's, he's very distrustful. And he just thinks that, you know, they're, that government career civil servants you know, work harder for some presidents than others. He just doesn't believe that there are people who are just trying to like, you know, just the facts thing. And I, and I, you know, I think that there are millions of people who do work in local and state and city governments that, that are trying to kind of help the public. There's bad eggs, there's bad journalists, there's people who are corrupt, there's bad teachers, and bad policemen and things. But I do think the majority of people are trying to do the right thing. Um, and then, you know, but the grievance thing, it's very common, I think, throughout human history, it's, it's, it's played to people. Uh, Bernie, before we started, and I'll, I'll keep this short, you know, I was a foreign correspondent before I, I uh, uh, was held captive when I covered the war in Bosnia by Bosnian Serbs who were, who were Christians. And then uh, when I was covering Afghanistan after 9-11, I was kidnapped by the Taliban and, you know, held by them for several months. And what struck me, you know, Sarah and Bernie, is that um, these guys were bombarded with propaganda. 9-11 was staged, you know, is what the young Taliban fighters were told. And it was the CIA and the Mossad, and it was an excuse for America to go, you know, invade Muslim countries. And they were told that U.S. soldiers were forcing Afghans to convert to uh, Christianity. The Serbs, who were Christians, thought that Muslims were bribing me to write bad stories about them. Like it was all kind of conspiracy theory. But what I found is I, you know, I think there's bad people who, you know, do things wrong or they know it's wrong and they like it for whatever reason. But I think that the bigger danger with human beings is our ability to rationalize. And there's a tendency where these Serbs were like, 
you know, we're fighting the Muslims in Bosnia because we're protecting Europe from a Muslim invasion. Like we, you know, and then the Taliban are telling themselves, I'm, we're protecting our families and our nation and our faith from this, you know, stage 9-11 attack. And so the danger is the ability of human beings to kind of rationalize that they are right and there's a plot against them. And that's why, you know, they have to resort to violence. We're not at that in this country, but it, it scares me when I hear the level of rhetoric on both sides. And again, Trump lies more. I, I think numbers show that. But, you know, this is not a game. And it's, you know, I want us to have a peaceful, vibrant, high turnout election that I hope resolves some of these tensions. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good point, the way you got the viewpoint for the, for the Taliban, too. You could you know, empathize enough with them to see that that's kind of what, how they were. Being. I mean, they, they were wrong, like factually, yeah. you know, I said, I, I, yeah. 9 was not stationed and like, yeah. and the, and I, I, the reporting in Bosnia, I found that they, the, the Serbs had carried out mass executions against uh, Muslims in, in one town, in Eastern Bosnia. And that, that was a fact. So, so it's, it just shows you the power and the danger, I think of, of conspiracy theories. Hmm. Right. Yeah, and the whole QAnon thing now, I mean, that's almost mainstream. There's several people in Congress running on that. People I talk to, even, even though they claim it's not QAnon, they're giving me the exact things that QAnon says, the microchips and the vaccine and all these things. You know, so that, yeah. that could be really dangerous too, I think. I've watched some even, yeah. even if we have a vaccine, mm -hmm. uh, and then again, this is like a nice bipartisan one for me, but you're going to have people on the left who won't take a vaccine for coronavirus and people on the right who won't take it. And, and I, I don't know, I mean, I would argue we need more transparency in government, all these secret things the CIA was doing, you know, and that Snowden, we need more transparency in government, um, you know, uh, and then I would argue that the public needs to realize that politicians have an incentive to divide us. Politicians have an incentive to kind of create a black and white picture. Um, you know, my, my kind of broader line is like, you, you know, the public has a right to be skeptical about career government officials, you know, about Tony Fauci or an FBI agent, or, you know, and be skeptical about journalists. But I would kind of urge people to not be cynical about them and, and you know, look for proof that they're doing something wrong, not just some random thing on your Facebook feed or, or you know, on, on Twitter. Um, there are systems for catching people that are engaging in corruption. Um, you know, they're not perfect, but the, the, the level of conspiracy theories that are spreading now, you know, I, I just think it's increasingly, increasingly dangerous. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think the term that I hear thrown around is we should have a healthy level of skepticism. <laughs> yeah. And if stuff is not, I mean, if you, Again, if you hear something crazy and it's not eventually making it on to Fox or CNN or MSNBC, it's probably not true. Like that, you, you again, I, I, there's people who guffaw, you know, when I'd say trust the mainstream media, but there, there are systems in place to check facts. You know, we make our, our, our reputation, our ability to make money is by getting people to pay a subscription to the New Yorker and for that to be sort of reliable information. So we're not perfect, there's bias, you know, there's all these kinds of things, but I just, um, if you're not seeing something spread widely through the media, then it's probably not true. Hmm. Do you have a favorite place in Maine? So I have, uh, Freiburg, Maine, Freiburg, Maine. Freiburg, Maine is your place. Freiburg, but I lived in uh, Freiburg and I also lived in Center Lovell. I love uh, the state I'm in Maine right now. I'm down in, in Kennebunkport. Um, with my in-laws and, and near my, my, my uh, parents. So I, I love Maine and it's great to be back here. And um, to the state's credit, you know, it's, it's still basically purple. It's not <laughs> far right or far left and, and Maine. That's a good color, yeah. Maine yeah. people are independent and, and, you know, God bless uh, them for being so. Beautiful last words. You, you have been listening to Scientifically Speaking here on WMPG with myself, Bernie, and David Rode. Stay tuned for songs from Mother Russia and her neighboring countries with our tour on Sweet Beauty Sea 
and from your favorite nerds, mask up, and we wish you healthy bodies and clean air. All right, finish. All right, done. <laughs> Excellent. You guys are great. <laughs> You're amazing. That was really great. It was fun. It was a lot yeah. of fun. Very right. casual. You're the most uh, dressed up of all. Sorry. <laughs> You're just wearing know. like sweaters. I, he said, to put one on, put a tie on. <laughs> yeah, I said, definitely. You got to. I do what Bernie tells me. <laughs> okay, yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, Bernie was like, oh, yeah, he went to go put on a tie. I'm like, he doesn't yeah. need a tie. I had a t shirt on it. Uh, so, you know. You should have just kept the t shirt. Well, no, no, no. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> What I know now with something really current going on, what other, um, because probably they'll be able to have a vote on the new Supreme Court justice, unfortunately, yeah. in, in before, because, you know, complete reverse of all the Republicans were saying last time with Merrick Garland, of course. So are there any other things that Democrats can do? Could they maybe start impeachment again, like Nancy Pelosi was saying, or? Um, yeah. I uh, don't, again, I'm not an expert on this. I mean, I've just read kind of news coverage like everybody else. Mm -hmm. There really isn't a way to, um, I think, to kind of, uh, you know, they could, they could try to drag it out through the filibuster or whatever. But I, I believe that legally there's not a way for them to uh, stop this uh, from happening. I mean, they can campaign on it and maybe create enough, you know, pressure on some of these senators, you know, and here we are in Maine, Susan Collins, the first senator to come out and say there shouldn't be a vote on this. So, yeah. Um, you know, people could pressure Susan Collins to not vote for this nominee mm -hmm. on the merits. Um, but, th th but there is not a way to kind of stop the Senate from uh, mm -hmm. confirming this thing other than getting, you know, four senators to vote against the, the nominee that I know of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it does change, though, the, you know, I think there's much, there's a lot of talk now of, of you know, adding to the number of justices, court packing, uh, these things that, that there's a lot of anger um, on the, uh, among Democrats. True. It may actually indirectly help Biden win in some sense, because I heard the Democrats raised like, I don't know, $300 million overnight when that happened or something. So that could be the only good side. If you lose a court, then, you know, I don't know, in the long well, run. Well, it's a, it's a, you know, uh, I wrote a piece about this this week that it's, it's, mm -hmm. uh, there's a, you know, the, the Antonin Scalia, the late Supreme Court Justice, uh, there's a group called the Federalist Society, which believes there should be a, these sort of strict interpretations of laws um, and, and more, a more conservative in interpretation of law. Um, since the 1980s, the Federalist Society has been recruiting young lawyers to be judges that are conservatives. Um, and what's amazing now is that there are sort of four justices who identify uh, with the Federalist Society um, they, they, they tend to rule that they, you know, um, you know, they tend to rule in, in conservative ways. And, you know, you could now have a majority of justices uh, from that, that group. And um, the concern is that the Senate, you know, isn't representative of the country, you know, uh, democratically in terms of the population, that the House is more representative and, and you have the Electoral College, which is also not, you know, a reflection of the popular will and the Senate, which is less, you know, more of a reflection of the popular will, but also has its own limits that they are, you know, choosing a court that doesn't reflect the will of, of most Americans. Um, the counter argument is that places like Maine wouldn't matter at all in a, uh, if there was no Electoral College, and it wouldn't, you know, with, with you know, a million people, that's an eighth of New York City. Um, and you'd have endless ca presidential campaigns waged in New York, California, and Texas. Um, yeah. And that would ignore the rest of the country. Right, right. Hmm. Yeah, there's points on both sides for that, I guess. Um, um, all right. Yeah, and I think people should know Fox is basically based on stories. I mean, they don't even really insist that they're true or checked out with like what you do. Well, I think there's like Chris Wallace, yeah. much, you know, much more, you know, rigorous journalists, um, you know. Yeah. The, the people that are doing the report, like understand the difference between, again, I mentioned the news pages of the Wall Street Journal, the news pages of, you know, Jen Griffin is a Fox News uh, reporter. She confirmed these stories about President Trump saying disparaging things about uh, veterans. You know, she's a reporter. Um, you know, uh, Sean Hannity, uh, you know, Rachel Maddow are more commentators. They're writing, you know, they're like opinion columnists. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, like be 
you know, skeptical in how you consume your information, but realize that, you know, Sean Hannity and, and, and Maddow, you know, um, you know, they are expressing their opinions, which is their right, but that's a different, different form than a straight news article. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So I was going to ask you something from the book in deep also, as you had mentioned, obviously the Patriot Act, and how that was set up supposedly to stop some of the terror. So how does that infringe upon our rights? And is that still in effect? Or has that been broadened? I know you had mentioned there were supposed to be some provisions that were supposed to go away. But I don't know if they ever did or what, what happened to the Patriot Act. So some of the provisions have expired. There used to be, you know, mm -hmm. right after 9-11, one of the original provisions was that, you know, people going into public libraries and mm -hmm. monitoring things. That that has, has, has dropped away. Um, mm -hmm. But I do think, you know, the, the fear post 9-11 gave uh, the government more authority to do more uh, surveillance. Uh, but I, I think that technology is advancing, has advanced so quickly in the nearly 20 years since 9-11 that, that I think it needs to be looked at again, that there's, they're able to collect so much information about us uh, because we're posting so much online that uh, there should be a review of the Patriot Act and which, which parts of it no longer apply. Um, you, you'll see that fear throughout American history leads to, you know, the Japanese American internment in World War II, World War II, you know, that it's, there's periods of fear when government overreach and government abuses happen. You think it was justified? Did they ever stop any terrorists since then? I don't. I do, so here's where I can be, you know, like, like I can, you know, uh, these Taliban were kind of brainwashed and some of them were very dangerous and, and I, I mean, I, I'm a biased, I, you know, I was biased, I was kidnapped, I considered it a crime, I was held for seven months. Um, yeah. So I, I, think, I think that um, there were possible terrorist attacks on the United States that were stopped as a result of the intervention in, in Afghanistan. Uh, there were other plots, you know, did it have to last so long? Did so many, um, you know, Americans have to die uh, and Iraqis and Afghans? I think no. But I, I do, and this is Mr. Middle Ground here, but like, you know, I, I, so this is something where I criticize the left. I don't think like um, there was no terrorist threat and the military industrial complex created this giant post 9-11 reaction. I think it was too big and it went on too long, but there, there was a real threat to the country. Okay. And then I'm wondering how they got away with this weapons of mass destruction and all the phony intelligence when never, that never existed. So Wouldn't I- Get us into the war? The yes. So I spoke to, you know, one of the characters in the book is uh, Joan Dempsey. She was- the number three official at the CIA at the time. And this isn't a great, you know, uh, you know, we're all so much, this is human psychology. This isn't a great thrilling answer. You know, she said that th there was pressure from the Bush, clearly the Bush administration wanted to hear that there was weapons of mass destruction from the, in Iraq, from the intelligence community. She said that these intelligence analysts knew about that pressure, but the primary thing that went wrong was that the intelligence analysts were terrified of missing another 9-11, that they, and they, they overreacted. And they, you know, she said they, you know, leaned, they got so far out, you know, over their skis or their shoes that they <laughs> fell forward. And so it was bias and fear that led them to look at, you know, very kind of questionable evidence and say, well, that's enough. Uh, we need to warn about this so there's not another 9-11 and that's not a great I, I there was all kinds of pressure from the bush administration that was that was you know um you know improper but she said that the, these these analysts you know made the wrong decision they made a mistake because they feared missing a, a big attack with wmd in the u.s and they've since tried to enact all these reforms and things but um that, I know that's not a satisfactory explanation. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> well, if it was an honest mistake, I guess that's okay. But if they had already planned to be doing all this and just throw the, that in. And the, even Bush, the Bush administration did. Yeah. But, but you see this a lot. So one of the, but a big, our biggest intelligence failures have been when intelligence officials tell presidents what they want to hear. The mm -hmm. Bay of Pigs, Vietnam. And so a big shift that was supposed to have happened way back in the 70s is that that intelligence briefings are supposed to be apolitical. The CIA is supposed to be apolitical. There's one, I think one or two or maybe three political appointees at the CIA, the director, that's it. Mm -hmm. The thousands of other people that don't work there work 
through different administrations. Same thing with the FBI, that it's a handful of people that come in. And now, and a change too, was that the FBI directors are supposed to serve 10 years, that they're not associated with any administration. Um, not 50 like J. Edgar Hoover, he got too powerful and too independent, but 10 years. So, but the danger now, again, is that you, you saw this whistleblower reporting that there was an intelligence report about Russian intervention in the, in the election, um, Russians trying to help Biden, um, and that that was suppressed, that was from the Department of Homeland Security, and that was suppressed by the Trump administration. Um, it's critical that intelligence officials speak truth to power, that they tell the truth to the American public, that they don't spin it one way or the other. Again, you can be Trump-like and think that's not even possible. I think that's, that's the goal, though, is that we should have apolitical intelligence officials who tell the public you know, what they know and what they don't know. Yeah, good. That way should be, yeah. So we're coming on the end of the show. Um, do you think you could share with our audience, you know, I know Bernie started off the segment saying that you had seven to eight published books, um, uh, <laughs> but are you working on anything right now or coming um, up? I'm, I, you know, I, I just wrote a, this, this story this week about, um, I, I do, I have covered, um, the, the, the group, there's a group of people who felt that these reforms went too far. I mentioned it earlier. Um, again, Justice Scalia, the late Supreme Court Justice, uh, many, you know, some conservative legal theorists, and then the Attorney General today, Bill Barr. Um, they believe that these reforms in the 70s went too far. They think that, you know, having independent counsels that can be appointed um, is, is unconstitutional, that a president can only be kind of reined in in two ways, according to Bill Barr, uh, an impeachment and an election, mm -hmm. and that there shouldn't be independent councils. Th what concerns me, you know, with the new, you know, Supreme Court and with what's happening now, when Donald Trump was impeached, he refused to hand over any evidence to Congress. Uh, you know, impeachment is unquestionably Congress's right. Uh, Richard Nixon handed over information to Congress after the Supreme Court, you know, said he should. So I am worried about the growing power of the presidency uh, Barack Obama was frustrated, couldn't get anything through Congress, so he used more and more executive orders. Donald Trump is doing the same thing, and I'm, I'm worried about Congress being weaker and more and more dysfunctional. I'm worried about the courts becoming politicized, and, you know, we, you know there's people arguing, Barr is arguing you need a strong presidency to kind of hold the country together. You know, I, I want to see, I don't want to see that. I want to see power divided between the three branches. I want transparency. I want annoying journalists to be able to ask <laughs> questions. And I, so I fear concentrations of power in big tech, uh, in academia, in journalism, and in, and in politics. Uh, I want transparency and a dispersal of, of power and, and a dispersal of, of data.